This has all come out of years of studying the Word and teaching the Word to the assembly. We spent two years in the book of First Peter, which really opened up a lot to us in terms of some eschatology. We went through other books in Ephesians and Colossians and a lot of the prophets. Through the years, just gradually, the whole prophetic landscape really dilates and it becomes quite amazing to see just how precise the Lord is. There are over 300 prophecies that specifically referred to the first advent, the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think in the last 24 hours on the cross, there were 20 or more prophecies that were fulfilled just in that short period of time. Prophecies, it's history written in advance. God is the infinite God, one who does not change. He is infinite in every way. He is both transcendent, that means that he is beyond space and time, and yet he is imminent. The whole of God is in all of space and time. If you think about that, that's quite awesome. He's transcendent and he's imminent. In fact, the whole of God is in every place, in every time, simultaneously. And I think if the listeners really listen to that, You just go down before the Lord because he is truly incomprehensible. When Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and he's everything in between, there is no time with God. He is timeless, and yet the whole of God is in every place and every time as the one who is infinite and supra-dimensional. He's created hyper-dimensional beings such as angels, and fallen angels have interdimensional capacities. But our God has all of those capacities, and then he transcends all that to infinity. He's to be feared in the sense of being revered, and we should live in awe. And yet, through Jesus Christ, this God has made it possible for us to know him as Father, to know God as Father. God only has one name. His name is Yahweh. It's Hayad, taken from the verb to be. He's absolute perfect existence. To be, I am that I am. His name is Yahweh. But he has many titles. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the Armies, Sidkenu, the Lord of our righteousness, Kadosh, our holiness, and all that which pertains to the various titles of God. Roi, our shepherd. Adonai, our master. Elohim, the sovereign and infinite God. The one who sees and provides, there's El Shaddai. There are many different ways in which God defines himself throughout the Old Testament, and we see that throughout the scriptures. If you gather up all the titles of who I am that I am is, as Yahweh, when we come to the New Testament, God is supremely manifested in the person of Jesus Christ as God the Father. That's the supreme and final revelation. So all the other aspects of God are summed up in who God is as Father. So that shows us his intent. When God as Father gave his uniquely begotten Son on the cross for us, that was a sacrifice of infinite proportions. And in the giving of his uniquely begotten son, Monogenes, he demonstrated his infinite love for lost mankind, which means that when Adam sinned, God took responsibility for the sin of the human race. He took responsibility when in the person of Jesus Christ, the scripture says God was in Christ, reconciling the world of lost mankind to himself, not counting or imputing their trespasses against them. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God's first act of righteous judgment against sin was in the person of the sinless Savior, Jesus Christ. That was a righteous judgment. The just for the unjust dying for our sins. We deserve this judgment. God the Father placed on Jesus Christ all the sins of the entire Adamic race, judged him, and then he died. He did this as God the Father, and this judgment was executed against his eternal Son, the Son of God and Son of Man. The great mystery that theologians have to grapple with is what happened to the deity of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. Where is that? God the Father judged Jesus Christ. The eternal Son shares the same attributes with the Father. The Son is consubstantial, co-essential, co-eternal with the Father, sharing the same glory and oneness of divine essence, yet distinct in person. What happened to the eternal Son? He's in kenosis. He had emptied himself. And yet, in that place of death, the eternal God, who is eternal life, we have a theological conundrum which cannot be comprehended by man. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he not only died as man, but there's the death of a God-man. 
It's incomprehensible. So what happened? In God the Father, a death occurred in him. It was his son. And that death is real. And yet for eternal life to experience that which was due to us is incomprehensible. And yet this is our God. As we think about the last things and last days, there's a lot of angst. There are people, as they watch various documentaries on 2012, we have a lot of different ways in which that's understood. But Tom Horn has done an excellent work gathering up what all the various cultures throughout history, the various people groups that have various ways in which they have perceived the end time. The Mayan calendar is only one representation. But 2012 is a confluence, not only of that which is the culmination of, I think it's a 25-year cycle in the Mayan calendar, but it's a confluence. The prophecy of Zohar 700 years ago also converges on 2012, which is a Jewish writing. There are others, and it converges in 2012. And what the transhumanists are actually expecting is that mankind as we know it will be phased out, and man will ascend into like a cyborg or a transhuman being, transhuman entity, that will be the combination of that which represents the ascended masters, which we know as fallen angels, splicing in of animal DNA and even plant DNA like was taking place in the days of Noah. This is their goal, and the merging and converging of artificial intelligence, all this confluence and merging of technologies, both biological, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, etc., as that all converges. The New Agers and the humanists see this as the point of singularity, that man will make a quantum leap into the status of Elohim. It's all a lie. As we noted last time together, it is a lie. And the people that do not receive the love of the truth, according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and believe the lie, it's not believe a lie, it's the lie in the Greek. And that lie is, you shall be gods, knowing good and evil, and basically you shall not die. This is what mankind is seeking to attain under the aegis and influence of the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2. And as we approach the end, folks, there is going to be a huge crisis between that which is true humanity, that is, who we are is originally created in the image of God, and that which is moving under satanic influence towards the homo noeticus, the Adam Cadmon, the new man of the new age, and that which will dominate the new age and the golden age of the Luciferian agenda. It is quite immense. It's very rapidly moving towards that goal. One person wrote me and was rather confused with reference to the remnant in the church age versus the remnant of the tribulation. And I perhaps didn't make that clear, but we will study the Jewish remnant tonight. And just notice from the scripture, the Jewish remnant, that will be alive and survive until the coming of the Lord. We see the Jewish remnant mentioned in the end of Matthew 25, where we have the goats and the sheep that are separated. When Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, those that survive the tribulation and unbelievers are separated as goats, as the unbelievers. And the sheep on his right hand, they go into the kingdom. That takes place when he returns. Those who survive the tribulation and make up in that particular imagery there at the end of Matthew 25, that's a surviving remnant. Those are Jews and the Gentiles that gave refuge and safety to the persecuted Jewish people of the tribulation. They will be remembered and they will be rewarded according to that passage in Matthew 25. When we think about the very concept of the Jewish remnant, we understand how God has worked through history always through a remnant. And when we see the history of his dealings with a the remnant. Then when it comes to the eschatology of the last days as it relates to Israel, we see that a remnant will be alive and survive until the coming of the Lord. Well, it's no different for the church age. It's the same principle, but we're a different people group. Often people refer to those that are saved in the tribulation as Christians. They are not Christians. Christians are only Christians in this dispensation. That is from Pentecost to the rapture. Those that are believers after the rapture are always referred to as saints. They're never referred to as Christians. You won't find anywhere in the New Testament or anywhere in the Bible where those that are believers in the tribulation are referred to as Christians. They are called saints. Now, we are called saints, too, in this dispensation. The saints in the dispensation of the church age, the dispensation of grace, that is, this divine economy, this specific administration of God, where he's calling out from among the Jew and Gentile a people for his name, Acts 15. We are Christians. In fact, that was a designation given by unbelievers to those that were the followers of Jesus, first at Antioch. 
I think that's important. And as we look at the whole issue of remnant, I did mention last time that it was very unique that the very word that the Holy Spirit selected to the Apostle Paul for those that will be alive and survive at the coming of the Lord is a remnant term. And if we go back to 1 Thessalonians, just to note that again, and then we'll, we'll see the background to this as we go to the Old Testament where we kind of left off last time. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, For we say to you by the word of the Lord, specific revelation that was given to Paul, this was not known in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. This was not known. Paul is the instrument of the revelation of that which refers to the translation or the resurrection of the church. We call it rapture. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive, and we notice the construction, the living ones, hyphen, namely, that which further defines those who are the living ones, the surviving remnant, perilapomai, until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. And again, the same construction occurs in verse 17. That very word there that further defines the living ones, and if we go back and look at the living ones, who are they? By definition, those who would be in full possession of divine life. First Timothy chapter 6, Paul exhorted Timothy, lay hold of eternal life to which you've been called. When we're born again, we have eternal life, but that life is to develop. It comes through knowing Jesus Christ. Father, this is the eternal life, that they may know you, the true and living God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. Eternal life is knowing, and that knowing in the Greek means an experiential knowing. And there are varying degrees of knowing, and therefore entering into eternal life experientially by knowing. We see in 1 John chapter 2, John refers to little children, young men, and fathers who have known him from the beginning. So fathers would be, in the fullest sense, an experiential possession and knowing of God as eternal life through Jesus Christ. Those who are alive, as we approach the end, these living ones are further defined as the word remain is surviving remnant. And I think I pointed out last time that in the Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the compilation of many authors, some authors are very liberal, and so you just can't pick up a Kittle and use this as your daily devotion. But it is the, the most exhaustive resource when it comes to the theological history of the Greek New Testament in terms of words that have theological significance. And it's ten volumes, and some volumes are almost a thousand pages. It is very exhaustive. In volume four, as I mentioned last time, this particular term that is used in First Thessalonians 4, 15, and 17 is included in the group hupolema and katalema, which is a term that means remnant. And I cited that in the pages, and I will not do that again this time. But I want to just read from this particular volume four regarding the meaning and the terminology of remnant, which is included there in that term in First Thessalonians 4, 15, and 17. Quoting from page 197, volume 4, often the remnant is a definite historical entity, namely the remnant of a people which survives a disaster. Thus the people is called a remnant under Hezekiah, 2 Kings 19.4, and Isaiah 37.4. And those who remained under Josiah are the remnant, 2 Chronicles 34.21. As are also those who remain in Jerusalem after the deportation of 597 B.C. under Zedekiah, 2 Kings 25.11. There's a whole series of passages. This particular contributor here says it is hard to say whether the remnant consists of those who are delivered from historical catastrophes or from eschatological judgment. What the author means is that when you're reading passages, especially in the prophets, where there's a reference to God delivering a remnant, does this refer to some immediate historical context or some future eschatological or end time context? And the point is, it's in the purpose of God that it can be dual. It can refer to a returning remnant. When the prophet spoke, that was partially fulfilled under Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah after the deportation and the captivity. And some of these remnant passages that you read in the Old Testament before the deportation, before the captivity, there's a partial fulfillment. But then as you read the passages and the surrounding text, we see that there is that which refers to an event that far exceeds anything that has ever happened historically. And so we know that these prophecies telescope. They're complexive. They're aspectival in that there can be a near-view fulfillment and a far-view fulfillment. Some prophecies only have a near-view fulfillment. Some prophecies only have a far-view. Some are complexive or aspectival. Many of the prophecies on the remnant are dualistic in their nature.
people who study the word and are serious about studying the word are able to see this. If you're just a casual reader of scripture and you just use it as a devotional text, this will not be meaningful to you. The reason for the inability to distinguish from a historical catastrophe versus eschatological judgment, and he gives a whole series of verses here which I'll read, he goes on to say the reason for this lies in the distinctive nature of Old Testament eschatology, that is the study of end things, which views historical and historical events together. I think that's just phenomenal. Eschatology, our study of last things, is concerned not only with the end of the time of this world, but also with the invasion of this time by God's reality. We study that under the day of visitation, 1 Peter 2.12. Thus the prophets proclaim the coming of God into the here and now, but they also understand all history as eschatological occurrence, which takes its meaning from the today of prophetic preaching. The history of the past, too, speaks of the coming of God which the prophet now proclaims, that is, in his day. If along these lines we consider that in the course of the history of God's people, the thought of the remnant was constantly applied to those who survived the great catastrophes of judgment, it is obvious that the boundary between the secular, that is, seeing it just in the historical context, and the theological use of the concept will be a fluid one. I just love that. I just think it's so tremendous that people think and write in these terms. There's a lot to read here under the section Lema, L-E-E-I-N-M-A, that's the English transliteration of the Greek term. Quoting again on page 198, in content, the idea of the remnant is under double control. It contains a reference to preceding judgment or sifting, but it also denotes the limitation of this judgment. The remnant has escaped it. Hence, the term implies both judgment and salvation. The reference to judgment remains in the use of the term. Thus, the greatness of the judgment is brought out in such passages like Amos 5, 3 and Isaiah 10, 22, which we'll look at. There's quite a bit of other references here. I can't read everything here tonight because it's very comprehensive, but just bring this to a conclusion here. Uh, when there is a reference to the remnant, Judgment on the people is always presupposed, and a remnant survives. The idea of sifting and separating is inherent in that of the remnant. It's just a follow-up from last time. When we see passages like 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it is time for judgment to begin the household of God and begins with us first. That is the household that can be translated as God's family. It begins with God's household, his family. Where will those who do not obey the gospel appear? And it is with difficulty the righteous are present tense being saved. The righteous is, again, referring to those who would be a part of that remnant. It's not talking about just those who are positionally righteous, but those who are putting on the breastplate of righteousness in terms of conduct, as we see in Ephesians 6, and pursuing righteousness, as Paul exhorts Timothy. But if it is with difficulty the righteous are being saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? We have these very clear and succinct statements in the Word of God, but when we read them, we think, well, that was way back then when Peter lived. But we didn't understand that Peter is writing in the context of what he sees in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand, so therefore be alert and sober for the purpose of prayer. And then he goes on to describe corporate life and corporate fellowship, and then 1 Peter 4, 12 and following, we see all of this is in the context of the last days, 1 Peter 4, 7, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, 1 Peter 1, 5. Peter is anticipating a final inbreaking of God in the last days, 1 Peter 2, 12, the day of visitation. We've covered this in past studies. And so now as we consider the end of all things at hand, and we move over to Revelation 2 and 3, we see the whole appeal throughout history and with finality and with special emphasis in the last generation on an overcoming remnant. The overcomer that is appealed to, to persevere and to remain faithful in Revelation 2 and 3, that overcomer is the New Testament way of defining the Old Testament remnant. If you're a part of the remnant of the Old Testament, you had to overcome great odds and great difficulties. I thought tonight, in order to clear up some confusion that some had regarding the whole concept of the remnant, is to just, first of all, focus on the scriptural reference to Israel in the context of God saving a remnant. 
So we'll look at some passages that have to do with God's historical deliverance of the Jewish people out of judgment, thus saving a remnant, and then how that telescopes and reaches on into the future of the last days for Israel. And the last days for Israel is defined as Daniel's 70th week. We see in Daniel chapter 9 that prophecy is for your people, Daniel. It specifically says for your people, that is the Jewish people. So it's not speaking of the church age. This is why we spent four different times of study in the Blessed Hope out of First and Second Thessalonians. The greatest difficulty that God has in each one of us as Christians and as his people is our natural strength. God has to take very patient and specific ways with us to reduce our natural strength, to circumcise our hearts of that old natural man and to break us of anything that represents natural strength I'm not talking about sin now, I'm talking about natural strength. So that, as Paul could bear testimony in 2 Thessalonians 12, 5 and following, when I am weak, then I am strong. It's when I'm weak that the power of Christ bivouacs over me. He talks about the various buffeting that he was going through by a specific angel that was assigned to him to buffet him so that he wouldn't be exalted. A messenger of Satan, it says, and experiencing insults and various kinds of suffering. And through that, his natural strength. The great Saul of Tarsus, when he got saved, God had a specific strategy to reduce him, to narrow him down to where he could say, apart from Christ, I can do nothing. In fact, he came to that place where apart from Christ, I dare not do nothing. I have no desire to do anything. I live by that strength. I can do all things, Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. I'm able to do all things. I have the strength to do all things through the one who is empowering me from within, in Dunuao. It's a participle through the one, Jesus Christ, and the person of the Holy Spirit, who empowers me from within. It's a word dunamis with the preposition and in front. Paul had clear understanding that he told Timothy to be strong in the grace which is found in Christ Jesus. The same word, in Dunamao. And that word, be strong in the grace, is passive voice, just like we see in Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. It's a present imperative. But it's a passive voice. It's a command for the saints. Habitually receive power from within through your union with the Lord. That's in the Ephesians 6 passage. Or in the Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 passage, be strong in the grace. Where is that found? In Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we are ensphered in Christ at new birth, baptized in the Christ, in him is the sphere of grace that empowers us. But we don't know grace. If we're living out of the old man, we're living out of the flesh, we need to be continually growing up into Christ with reference to all things, Ephesians 4.15, and to learn to appropriate Christ as our very life. Christ does not give us victory, as Major Thomas says. He is our victory. Christ doesn't give us life. He is our life. Christ does not give us strength. He is our strength. 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ the power of God. Christ the wisdom of God. He doesn't give us wisdom. He is our wisdom. And out of dire circumstances often, being just reduced, leveled by the providential arrangement of our circumstances, we reach the place where we learn what Jesus said in John chapter 15. Apart from Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. John 15, if we have the branch abides in the vine, then we will bear fruit. Otherwise, nothing comes forth. Jesus spoke the same thing in John 5, 19 and 30, that apart from the Father, he does nothing. He only does that which he sees the Father doing. So even Jesus Christ in his perfect, sinless humanity lived by the power of God as man. Jesus Christ has come in the personal Holy Spirit to live in us and to bring us into that same kind of relationship, that same kind of knowing that he had when he as man through the Holy Spirit lived in perfect dependence upon the Father. If you want to pursue that further, I would just type in Major W. Ian Thomas and go into sermons online and you can listen to some very excellent messages which are very much life-changing. So going back to focusing on the remnant of the Old Testament, we're going to pick up in Deuteronomy with reference to the coming judgments of the tribulation. We see a passage here that refers ultimately to the end of the age leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ to deliver the Jewish people. In Deuteronomy 32, 34 through 43, we see in Deuteronomy 32, 34, Is it not laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries, that is, the instruments and the various ways in which I can bring judgment upon the earth? We see in Job 38 that there are hailstones that, according to Revelation, weigh 100 pounds. 
Well, he will use that in the day of judgment. It's sealed up in his treasuries. Verse 35, vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time, their foot will slip, that is, my enemies and the enemies of my people. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. But Ephesians 1, 11, God is working all things after the counsel of his will, and that word working is supernaturally operating. For the Lord, it says in verse 36, will vindicate his people, that is, he will render judgment that will result in their vindication, and simultaneously he'll render judgments that will represent vengeance and retribution against his enemies. So on one side, the judgment brings destruction upon the enemies of God. The other side, with reference to a righteous remnant, which we'll see, it'll be vindication. It'll be deliverance. So the Lord will vindicate through act of judgment his people and will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone. When he sees their strength is gone. And there's none remaining, bond or free. That means a reduction. That is a specific reference to a remnant. Now we're going to just notice a very interesting and a very poignant passage in Isaiah 10 that is very clear and very defining. God speaking to Isaiah in the context that Syria is going to be used by God to judge the northern kingdom. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 10. It would be like the Chinese communists or the Russians invading America. Well, how could God allow anything like that to happen? Well, read Habakkuk. And you can find out why he can do that. But in this case, it was Assyria. And that actually happened historically. But in this passage, the Assyrians in the historical context are the instrument of God's judgment in Isaiah 10. But it also telescopes and it represents the final end of history, the end of this age, just prior to the coming of Jesus Christ to establish his 1,000-year millennial reign. So in Isaiah chapter 10, it's in that context of the historical judgment upon the northern kingdom, which has already happened. We see this statement, which not only pertains to a remnant that would be saved out of this judgment by the Assyrians, but it refers ultimately to a final end time, which we will see as we go through some scriptures together. Now, it will come about on that day. In the context, it was ultimately the day of the Lord. That a remnant, a remnant, those who survived, of Israel and those of the house of Israel who have escaped will never again rely upon the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord and the Holy One of Israel. In other words, they won't be making alliances with pagan nations. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And the word return in the Hebrew is the same theological concept as repentance. When a remnant returns, that means they have repented. There is a repentant remnant and it's referred to as the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people, o Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. The overflowing with righteousness, again, is a term for the remnant. When we look at the New Testament, somehow this whole thing has escaped us. And that's why we looked at Revelation 2 and 3, under the final revelation of Jesus Christ. We tried to point out the last four phases of the church age. There are specific judgments that will culminate in the time of the day of visitation just prior to the rapture. I can't go into this in great detail now, but there's going to be that which will appear to be, by many, like an Armageddon event, a catastrophe that some may interpret as Armageddon, and it's a false flag. It's Satan's last assault upon the church. And once that judgment, which will sift out, and all that will remain is that which is Philadelphia, those who are alive and survive will be Philadelphia, then they will be called to meet the Lord in the air. It's not eternal salvation issue. It is surviving historical judgment as a remnant. And we have throughout history a number of examples of how when God finally brings in judgment, that a remnant survives and escapes that judgment. And that's what we see here in Isaiah chapter 10. Now let's go back and just notice a few passages in Isaiah. There are many others. We could look at Isaiah 7 and 8 and we could see that one of his own sons were defined as Yashar Yashuv. That is, Yashar is a remnant will return. That was the name of one of his sons and he was to be assigned to that generation. So going back to Isaiah chapter 4, the whole context from chapter 1 through 5 is the warning of God's coming judgment upon his people. Not only the northern kingdom, but also this would ultimately include the southern kingdom as well. 
So picking up the context of the warnings that God is speaking to Jeremiah, we see a reference to not only a near-view fulfillment, but ultimately to an eschatological or final end-time fulfillment, beginning with Isaiah 4, 1. For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, ultimately the day of the Lord. Why? Because, as we read in this passage, mankind will become more rare than the gold of Ophir. Men have been killed in war. They've been eliminated. Seven women will take hold of one man on that day. Men will be scarce, saying, we will eat our own bread, wear our own clothes. In other words, we're not going to be a liability to you. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. So they're willing to not even be supported, but to take away the reproach of being unwed. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful. This is a title for Messiah. The branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. See that? The survivors of Israel. In other words, when we talk about the coming of the Lord for Israel, it will be survivors. What will happen? Those that do not survive the tribulation, as we're going to see, are going to die. They'll either die as martyrs, or they're going to die because they have not repented or put their faith in Yeshua, the Messiah. It will come about that he who is left in Zion, and remains in Jerusalem. Notice, left and remains. That's remnant terminology. Will be called holy. A holy remnant. Those who are alive and survive will be holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. What is recorded for life? This is not the Lamb's Book of Life. We enter into that roster of the Lamb's Book of Life when we're born again. That is, it's already there, but we become a part of that elect when we believe in Jesus Christ. Everyone who is recorded for life. In other words, this recording, as we're going to see, is special provision for a righteous remnant. In other words, there will be those who are alive and survive in the coming Lord. They will be recorded for life. As days get darker and judgment begins at the household of God and the black awakening occurs, super soldiers are released, as Russ has articulated in his book, The Black Awakening. Then what about a remnant? Those who are recorded for life. And then he says, notice, what is this judgment for? When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, the filth, and has purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem. Often there was ritual sacrifices going on. When the Lord has purged, rinsed away, washed away the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion, over all these assemblies, a cloud by day and even smoke and brightness and flaming fire by night. For over all, the glory will be a canopy. This is when he returns to this earth. And there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and a refuge of protection from the storm and the rain. Ultimately, he will come to bring deliverance and blessing and peace and prosperity as the Prince of Peace. But notice what precedes. And notice who escapes a remnant. Let's look at the next passage. And there could be many others. I'm not touching on all of them, but this is representative. We'll turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And we know in this passage that Isaiah sees the vision of Jesus Christ according to John chapter 12. John says the prophet saw Jesus' glory in the day of Isaiah. We see that reference there in John chapter 12. This revelation of God to Isaiah the prophet. The prophet is cleansed. And he recognizes that he's a man of unclean lips dwelling amongst unclean people. He's cleansed and responds to God's call to continue to be his prophet. And we see in Isaiah 6, God says, Go tell this people, keep on listening, do not perceive, keep on looking, do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive and their ears dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and repent and be healed. They're also used in two different occasions in the Gospels. It's also used at the end of the book of Acts. Paul quotes it. So we see this prophecy is aspectival. It had a fulfillment. It was used in two different circumstances. When our Lord was preaching to the multitudes in the Gospels, it's used by Paul at the end of Acts. And yet, this prophecy also had a fulfillment during Isaiah's time. So this is a perfect example of the prophecies that can have multiple aspects of application. In other words, a fulfillment. He says, then, Lord, I said, how long? Verse 11. He answered, until cities are devastated without inhabited houses or without people, and the land is utterly desolate. So it's very clear a judgment. And this occurred when the Assyrians came in, and also 
by extension, when the Babylonians came in and invaded the southern kingdom of Judah. He says, And the land is utterly desolate, and the Lord has removed men far away, that is deportation, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it. That's a tithe. By the way, you read Ezra and Nehemiah, a tithe of the people left Babylon, which then had become Persia. They left and went back to become a remnant that returned to rebuild the temple, to restore it under Ezra, to restore the ministry there and some of the furnishings, and then under Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. It was a remnant. So notice, it says a tenth portion will be in it. That's a tithe. That's a remnant. And it will again be subject to burning. I believe that's referring to the Great Tribulation. Like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. The holy seed, remnant, that is there juxtaposed in the word of God. Isaiah 59, we see in this passage a reference to Jesus Christ coming back to deliver his people Israel. And in this passage, it is quite amazing. Isaiah 59, in the midst of the prophet defining the horrific apostate conditions of God's people at that time in the previous verses. Verse 15, truth is lacking. He who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. This is Isaiah 59, verse 15. The Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight, and that there was no justice, and he saw that there was no man, and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. Here it is, Jesus Christ put on righteousness like a breastplate. So here we have a reference. This is what Paul cites in Ephesians 6, 14, where the church is to put on the whole armor of God. Why? When the church has attained the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and character logically is bearing the attributes of that which is described as a whole armor of God, then Jesus Christ dons this armor in the person of his church and returns. He's clothed with his glorified body, the church, and he comes back to deliver Israel. That's why Romans 11 says, a deliverer will come from Zion, out of Zion. Paul says in Romans 11:25, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, or uninformed of this mystery, the secret, lest you be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel, that is, during this dispensation, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in that full number of Gentiles that will complete the body of Christ. And thus all Israel will be saved. That is, the remnant is being saved now, but then all Israel as a nation will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Quoting Isaiah 59. But notice in the Greek translation there, he will come from Zion. That's because Zion is, Hebrews 12, the church glorified in that place of dominion, in union with Christ, that place of government, is in heaven. So there's the heavenly Zion. He will come from Zion, the antitype of the type of the earthly Zion. In this passage, he doesn't come from Zion, he comes to Zion, because this is the earthly or the Jewish perspective. So when you're looking at the church, and you're in the church age, he comes from Zion. But when you're reading it from the perspective of the Jew, he comes to Zion. It's a slight little shift in nuance, but it's very important to know that the Holy Spirit is absolutely perfect when it comes to making these kinds of distinctions, because he's God. Jesus dons the very armor that the church is exhorted to put on in Ephesians 6, helmet of salvation on his head, verse 17 of Isaiah 59, but on garments of vengeance for clothing, that's when he returns to deliver his people wrapped himself in zeal as a mantle, and according to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands he will make a recompense. This is all found in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising sun, that is, from the east. For he will come like a mighty, or narrow, pent-up stream, like this immense energy that finally breaks like a dam which the wind or the Spirit of the Lord drives, and a Redeemer will come to Zion. Paul says, comes from Zion. That's the church age view. Here, from the Jewish perspective, at the end of the Jewish age, or Daniel's 70th week, a Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord, those who turn, that's a remnant. We're going to continue on with these passages, which are quite amazing. We're going to turn to Micah. He's one of the minor prophets, is called, not because they're not as important, but just in terms of their messages are shorter than the other prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah. 
Micah had already cited Isaiah 2 that this is quoted, but Micah quotes Isaiah in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Again, we see an eschatological passage as it relates to the coming of the Lord to deliver the Jewish people. He will judge between many peoples, Micah 4 and verse 3. We see in this passage the promise of Jesus Christ returning to establish peace in Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, and then Micah, as I said, is quoting it in Micah 4, 1 through 4. So we're going to pick up the context in that day, that is when the Lord returns to settle the score, to deliver his people, and to establish his 1,000 year reign. Micah 4, 6, and this is the point, this is where the remnant comes in. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcasts, those who have been rejected, even those whom I have afflicted. This is descriptive of a surviving remnant. I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast, those who have been rejected by the religious establishment, and by application, there are many Christians today who have been rejected by the established church. We've been asked to leave two churches since we've been here in Syracuse. Just because of the work we do, working with generational SRADID, there's no place for that in the churches. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know about it. In fact, a lot of them don't even believe it. I will make the lame a remnant, the outcasts, those who have been rejected, a strong nation. The Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. Then he says, as for you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So we see the promise of the restoration of the Jewish remnant to be with the Lord in the millennial reign of Christ. Tremendous things to think about. Let's turn to Zephaniah, another tremendous passage. Zephaniah, the whole book is on the day of wrath that's going to come on Judah near view, and the executor would be the Babylonians. But it ultimately reaches towards the great day of the Lord, Zephaniah 1.14. And Zephaniah 2, we see Judah's enemies are going to be punished, and ultimately that will refer to those that are under Antichrist. Then we see God indicting the current situation during the prophet in Zephaniah 3 of the rebellious, tyrannical city referring to Jerusalem. The Lord is righteous within her, and he will do no injustice, Lamentations 3.5. Every morning he brings his justice to light and he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. In other words, they're still not in a place of repentance. And he goes on and describes his judgment on the nations and the fact that that judgment will first begin with his people. Just by way of a side note, the tribulation period, first and foremost, is going to be a judgment against the Jews, Ezekiel 20, for their rejection of Messiah, as we're going to see more and to break them, bring them to repentance for the rejection of the Messiah. To discipline them and judge them as God's covenant people. But it's also simultaneously a judgment against the nations for their attitude against God and against the Jewish people. And we see that also running side by side as an end time eschatological phenomenon in the last days. When the wrath of God is poured out, he's dealing with the nations, but at the same time he's also purging and disciplining that which will represent the Jewish remnant when Jesus Christ returns to deliver them. And so by way of principle, it's going to be the same way. The whole church is not in a place where there's a corporate cry of the elect. Luke 18, it's just not there. There are a number of believers crying out for God, like those that are suffering in North Korea and various communist regimes and totalitarian regimes and Muslim regimes. But the whole church, there's not yet one corporate collective cry, but there will be when the Lord comes to deliver his people, for Thessalonians 1.10. In this passage of the context of the coming of the Lord, again, we're just looking at that remnant as it relates to Israel. God makes an appeal to them. And this back up to Zephaniah 2. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, that is, all the judgments associated with the great and terrible day of the Lord, as he just mentioned in chapter 1. The day passes like chaff. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. In other words, gather yourselves together. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth. A description of the remnant. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth. Well, do we? Well, humility. If there's humility, we will be seeking the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness. That is moral conformity to the revealed will of God and thought, word, and deed. Seek humility, that is, all that which represents a continual dependence upon the Lord, recognizing our own impotence and his omnipotence in terms of our walk 
and who we are. Everything must derive from Christ as the vine. He says, perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah means those whom Yahweh hides or conceals. Therefore, it connotes protection. So let's go on and just skip down to chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore, wait for me. Again, appealing to those who would be God's remnant. It's not a salvation issue. It's a characterological issue as we approach the end. Therefore, wait longingly and expectantly, is what the Hebrew means, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to the prey. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, these would be the Gentile nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. That has not yet been fulfilled. In Revelation 6-19, we will see the ultimate fulfillment of that. For then I will give to the people's purified lips. And this doesn't mean they will start speaking Hebrew, as some people will think, but it, it means a holiness. That means they're demonstrating right speech as it relates to right thinking about God. There's not profanity. There's not uncleanness. I will give the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. That is, God wants a company of a remnant. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, my dispersed ones, that is, those who have been dispersed through judgment, who will bring my offering. In that day you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for then I will remove from your midst your proud and exulting ones. You will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. Notice, I will remove the arrogant. The humble will make up the remnant. The arrogant will be removed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is a specific eschatological promise to the Jewish people as they approach the end. Christians will not inherit the earth. They will not. Our inheritance is in Christ. Our inheritance is a heavenly inheritance. For the Jewish people, the humble, those who are surviving remnant will be humble, and they will be alive and survive when Jesus returns to go into the millennial reign. We could go through the New Testament on the parables, especially the parables in Matthew 13, the parable of the sower, and we see the unrighteous are burned, and yet the wheat goes into the garner, that is, it goes into the kingdom. And so there are so many parables that are the platform for the coming of Jesus Christ as it relates to Israel. Remember Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 15, when Jesus says, I came to none other than the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, do not go to the Gentiles for salvation is of the Jews. So the whole first advent of Jesus Christ was to the Jews. And it doesn't mean there's nothing there for us as Christians, but we have to understand the framework in terms of who he came for. I mentioned this before, one of the greatest commentaries on this in understanding the whole first advent ministry of Christ is The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva McLean. Uh, theological study starting from Matthew all the way through the book of Revelation on the greatness of the kingdom. It's absolutely tremendous. Notice in this passage, verse 11 of Zephaniah 3, I will remove from your midst your proud and exulting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain, referring to Mount Zion, where Jesus' throne will be on that mountain, and he will rule and reign over the whole earth for a thousand years. As I mentioned, Isaiah 2, 1-4, and it's quoted again in Micah chapter 4. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people. Lowly means they don't think anything of themselves. God is great. They don't see any greatness in themselves. A humble and a lowly people. They will take refuge in the name of the Lord. Proverbs 18.10 The name of the Lord is a fortress. It is a stronghold. And the righteous, another term for the remnant, are habitually running into it now lifted high to safety. Proverbs 18.10 They will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they shall feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. That would be the future remnant. You read on down and see how there's going to be a great celebration and the curse that has been over the children of Israel for the last 2,000 years will be turned into immense and tremendous blessing. Let's turn to Zechariah, chapter 8. Zechariah is one of the, what's called the post-exilic prophets. Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi, they prophesied to those who came out of the time of judgment and captivity. Zechariah is tremendous. It's kind of like a mini-apocalypse in a lot of ways. So we can't really go into the details. It's a great book to study as it relates to the returning remnant. 
and how Zachariah and Haggai had contemporaneous messages that are intercalated, as they're interfaced, and they are spoken to that returning remnant, and they returned in 536, and when they came back to Jerusalem, the whole project of restoring the temple came to a halt because of the Samaritans, the half-breeds that were threatening them. The building project stopped for about 15, 16 years, and then in 521 B.C., God stirred up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to go speak to the remnant, encourage them you need to continue on and regardless of the opposition you see that all the way through the two prophets I am with you and you're to continue on and he rebukes them and Haggai for settling down in their own well paneled houses while his house lies desolate we see these wonderful prophecies that have a contemporary fulfillment to the returning exiles during the time of Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah what we see here also in these prophecies so much is looking forward to the coming day of the Lord and the second coming of Christ as it relates to the Jewish people. And we have to remember, there's no church here. There's no church mentioned in the Old Testament. It's just not here. That's a part of the great mystery that was revealed to Paul in the mystery teaching, that which refers to God's sacred secret, Ephesians 1, 9-11, Ephesians 3, 1-11, Colossians 1, 25, many passages, Romans 16, 25, and 26, the word mystery. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 8. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, God speaking through Zechariah to that remnant who had returned to Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, second advent. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. In other words, the Lord will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 14, the subject is the Lord, Yahweh, and it says in Zechariah 14, verse 3, his name is Yahweh. Verse 4, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's Jesus Christ. So Yahweh's feet is Jesus Christ. For those who are Jehovah Witnesses that say that Jesus Christ is not Yahweh, you're in a cult. The Jesus you believe in is not the Jesus of the Bible. According to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3 and 4, Yahweh's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives when he returns. He's going to return in the exact same manner as we see in Acts 6. So this Yahweh of Zechariah 14, 3 and 4 is Jesus Christ. You need to be warned if you're a Jehovah's Witness because you do not believe in the fact that Jesus Christ is Yahweh in the flesh. And you need to be warned because you are in a cult. Notice this. He says he will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, Zechariah 8, 3. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, will be called the Holy Mountain, again, when Jesus returns. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men, old women, will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of his age, and in the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. And thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant, that is the remnant that Zechariah is speaking to, if it is too difficult or too wonderful in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, Will it also be too difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to say that is rescue and deliver my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. East, that reaches all the way to China. West, reaches in our generation all the way to the United States. I will bring them back and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem and they will be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Then he goes on to say, let your hands be strong. He's encouraging them. He says in verse 11, But now I will not treat the remnant of this people as in former days. I will cause the remnant, verse 11, to inherit all these things. And it will come about, verse 13, that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you, rescue you, that's a remnant, and you may become a blessing. Do not fear. Let your hands be strong. He's speaking to the current remnant under the time of Zerubbabel, and it's an also dual reference speaking to that remnant at the end. I want to go to Malachi and then just kind of wrap this up. Malachi is the last of the prophets after the time of Nehemiah, and we see the apostasy that had already settled in even after the days of Nehemiah. Malachi closes with a warning to that which would be like the Laodicean church. In Revelation 3, 14 and following, we have that which is lukewarm that had settled in among the people in Malachi's time. The people are basically in a condition. There's been a great decline. Up 
pick up Malachi 3, verse 13. Your words have become arrogant against me, says the Lord, yet they're so dull, they're so spiritually obtuse, yet you say, what have we spoken against thee? The Lord answers, you have said it is vain to serve God. What profit is there that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So we now call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. That's what it seems like before God breaks in in the day of visitation. Verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord, this is a remnant, they spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. This book of remembrance is special provision for that remnant, so that when judgment comes, they are preserved. Those who are alive and survive shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. God is looking right now at Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord are roaming throughout the entire earth, searching and seeking to show himself strong towards that one whose heart is slim, perfect and whole and complete towards God. God is noticing. So he writes down in the book of remembrance, this is special provision for a remnant, like we saw in Isaiah 4, that there is deliverance. Remember we saw that in Isaiah 4. There's this provision for a remnant. The Lord gave attention to it. He heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear, revere, and respect the Lord and who esteem his name. This again characterized the remnant. And they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own special treasure, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. This principle will be true at the end of the church age. He's speaking here about a Jewish remnant at the end of the age of Israel, Daniel's 70th week. But the principle is the same. That's why the whole book of Peter, the whole emphasis is Peter says, Be ye holy as I am holy. There's a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. It's not just initial salvation, but there's an eschatological salvation that is to be revealed. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 compared to First Peter 2.12 is called the day of visitation. He says, And they will be mine. He will spare them. And so you will again, verse 18, distinguish between the righteous, that is a remnant, and the wicked, that is those who have fallen away and are in apostasy, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. For behold, the days are coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evil doer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root or branch. In other words, when that passes through, we saw Isaiah, chapter 10, a judgment has been determined overflowing with righteousness. Complete destruction. We don't grasp this. When we look at where we are in history as the church, we are asleep to the fact that this is what God is going to do in the church prior to his coming to take the church out. There's going to be a sifting. There's going to be an elimination process. We're oblivious to it. But for those who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, that's a term for Jesus Christ returning to deliver Israel. The Son of Righteousness, that's the millennial reign of Christ. Righteous could be translated, the Son of Vindication will rise like a morning star with healing in its wings. And you, that is that Jewish remnant, will go forth and skip about like calves from a stall. For the church, Jesus comes as the morning star. That's preceding the millennial day. And you will tread down the wicked. This is a reference as we see in the prophecies of Zechariah, chapter 9 and following. Those of the tribe of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they will tread down the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. We see, again, this principle of special provision that God has made for the Jewish remnant. We come over to the book of Revelation, and the overcomer is the equivalent to a remnant in its individual, to the one overcoming. We come to the church of Philadelphia. We see in this particular church in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, there's no condemnation. There's only commendation. And we see the fact that there is a promise of access to that which represents the key of David, dominion in the kingdom, access into the royal treasury of, of the Godhead. The key of David is authority. We covered this in some detail in the final revelation of Jesus Christ, so I won't look at that again. People can review that if they wish. But we see that they're just a small remnant. Verse 8, because you have little power, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
there are events coming. Did you know, and by way of a historical example of this, when Mao Zedong came to power in 1949, from 1949 there were a number of purges. In 1952, Watchman Nee was arrested. He spent the rest of his life in prison. But there were many Christians arrested, and they were forced to either deny their faith or be killed. And there are all kinds of horrible things they were told to do, which I will not mention. And those that capitulated, they were given rice. The others were starved or killed. They were called rice Christians. And nine-tenths of those who were professing Christians during that period of communist takeover in China, nine-tenths apostatized. They turned away. They denied his name. That doesn't mean they were not all Christians. There have been Christians that have denied his name throughout history. But what happens? They're not recorded for life in Jerusalem. We saw in Isaiah 4. There is going to be an issue between the light side and the dark side, and those issues are going to come to the forefront very, very soon. And we need to know where we are. We need to know the provision that God has made for his remnant and say, Oh, Lord, show me. Show me where I'm not seeking you, as we saw. Show me where my heart is not right with you. And we see one of the characteristics of them is they're humble, they're lowly, as we see here into the message to Philadelphia in Revelation 3.8. Because you have little power, and you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. It's commendation. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan. In this time period, the recognized establishment that was persecuting Christians were Jews. Today, they're not Jews. It can be the institutionalized establishment of that which calls itself Christian church, persecuting those who are in the category of Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. They're manifesting the characteristics of those who are loving God's people as Jesus loved them. Philadelphia, brotherly love. The old law will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. They say they are Jews, and they are not. But they lie. They claim to be the people of God. They're not the people of God. Behold, I will make them come and bow down at your feet. That has never happened yet. There has never been a remnant that has been so honored by God, by those who have been accusing and representing a satanic hostility towards them. God hasn't made any of these people come and bow down on an eschatological basis. This will happen in the day of visitation. This will happen. Jesus Christ will cause those accusers, those condemning you, be cast you out of their assembly, whatever it be, they will come and bow down at your feet and know that I have loved you. Verse 10. And because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing, which is about to come upon the whole inhabited earth to test those who have settled down and made earth their home. So as we approach the end, those who are alive and survive are going to be delivered. They're not going to be here in the tribulation. Many people use this passage, Revelation 3.10, as a pre-tribulation rapture promise. It is a pre-tribulation rapture promise, but not for the whole church, for those who are Philadelphia. If you're in a Laodicean category, don't claim this verse for yourself. If you're in a category of Pergamum or Thyatira, you're involved in those kind of activities, don't claim this verse. This is for Philadelphia. This is for a church where there's no reproach. There's no correction. So make sure that you don't deceive yourself by thinking that Revelation 3.10 is just a carte blanche rapture promise. It's a promise for a remnant, a Philadelphia remnant. And so may God correct us and strengthen us with his word. I just pray for each one who is listening that God will speak to you. If he's calling you to drop what you're doing, squandering your time away in front of a television or video games, whatever you're doing, and seek the Lord. Get in his word and seek the Lord and be with his people and say, Lord, I want to be among those whom you record for life. I want to be among those who are truly living ones. Namely, the surviving remnant who will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall ever be. So this is not an eternal salvation issue. This is an eschatological deliverance issue. So may God cause his word to hit its mark and out from this create and stimulate a remnant to be used by him mightily in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen.